Sweet. So Max Lugavier is a filmmaker, health and science journalist, and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Genius Foods, Become Smarter, Happier and More Productive While Protecting Your Brain for Life, published in eight languages around the globe. He's also the host of the number one iTunes health podcast, The Genius Life. And most recently, he's written a cookbook called Genius Kitchen, where Max shares over 100 recipes to make your brain sharp, body strong and taste buds happy. How are you, Max? I'm doing well. It's great to be here with you, man. I'm a huge fan and I'm a friend, but like this is our first face-to-face interaction. So uh, I'm I know. excited for what for what unfolds. This is a very modern day friendship. It's like we feel like we know each other, but we have only ever liked each other's posts on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who is the uh, the sex ed teacher who you routinely feature on your on your Instagram page? Sex? Oh, do you mean my character, the sex ed teacher? Yeah, of course. Oh, that's Dr. Louise Higginbotham. I love She's that. not a doctor, but she is a mother, and that's the same thing. <laughs> She's amazing. She's yeah, amazing. Um, I, uh, I'm a big fan of your content. I'm a big fan of what you put out because it's clear and it's concise and it's never too extreme. Uh, I've never seen you eat raw liver and throw a spear, <laughs> which is equal parts uh, disappointing, but also like you know, I can relate to all the stuff that you're putting out. And I feel like a lot of people can, I want to clear, I want to use this podcast as an opportunity to clear up a lot of the crap that gets pushed out into the ether from health and wellness people. Recently, I've been hearing vegetables are bad for you, you know, because of anti-nutrients or the, 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 the chemicals that plants release to protect themselves from being eaten. Can you clear that up for me? Are vegetables bad? Yeah. D- vegetables are not bad. Um, I mean, we have a number of really, great studies at this point, a robust body of literature um, with fairly rigorous research showing us that the that increased consumption of fruits and vegetables is associated with better health, increased longevity. Um, if, this is, if this were just one or two studies here and there, it would be easy to write them off. But we have many meta-analyses at this point showing us that fruit and vegetable consumption is strongly associated with with better health. Now, that's not to say that every vegetable is going to work for every person, right? Or every fruit is going to work for every person. Like there is no such thing as a one size fits all diet. So I think people hear the hyperbole that sometimes gets passed across as diet advice in the wellness world on social media, and they adopt that to be gospel. They, they, they hold that as gospel, but ultimately, I mean, we, we, so what science is good at is reducing uncertainty, right? So ultimately, at the end of the day, your ideal diet is going to be something that you have to dis- discover for yourself through trial and error, right? Like the amount of fiber that works for me might not work for you, right? I might do really well with nightshade plants. You might not. Lectins might be fine for me, but maybe if you have active autoimmunity, you'll feel better, see a reprieve from symptoms from cutting them out. So um, ultimately, everybody's going to be different, but at the end of the day, fruits and vegetables are great for you. Awesome. I, I'm, I, I read your cookbook yesterday. I've already made a few of the recipes, but I started reading from the top because it's a great cookbook, um, not only because of the recipes, but also it kind of gives you a great rundown on health and wellness. Talk to me about why vegetables. Let's just start there. Why yeah. vegetables are important. Yeah. So, I mean, vegetables are great from a number of different standpoints. For one, they are rich in fiber. I mean, that's like the most sort of obvious benefit of, of consuming veggies that you get a nice hit of dietary fiber, which supports the gut microbiome. So we have this colonic ecosystem comprised of about 30 trillion microorganisms that include um, viruses even, but primarily bacteria. And that ecosystem is really important for A, training the immune system of the body. Actually, your immune system, 80% of your immune system is is centered around the gut because the gut actually is your largest interface with the environment. We like to think of our skin as being our primary interface with the environment, but what's actually in the lumen of your gut, meaning the interior contents of your digestive tract, are not actually, that's still your environment because those contents are not inside of you, right? And it's that bacteria that actually serves to provide a sort of uh, boot camp, if you will, for your immune system so that your immune system is able to recognize what is foreign, what is um, not what's helpful, what's pathogenic. And so we know that eating a healthful diet rich in a diverse array of dietary fibers and, and other compounds like polyphenols helps to support the beneficial commensal bacteria. So the bacteria that consume that fiber, um, and it helps to keep pathogenic bacteria at bay, which reside in all of us, right? But the, it's the good bacteria that sort of police the bad bacteria. So Fiber is beneficial for that for that reason. It's also beneficial because it's satiating. It mechanically stretches out the stomach, so it turns off hunger signals. Um, 
And then many of these so-called toxic chemicals that are found in um, plants actually are beneficial through a hormetic effect that they have. So hormesis is the concept given to the fact that toxins or, or any chemical really at a high enough dose will become toxic and therefore dangerous, but in, a, in small amounts actually um, provides a sort of strengthening effect. It's, uh, it's the scientific backing of that adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's true for um, many things in life, but it seems that these sort of toxic compounds and vegetables that, that exist to ward off smaller um, organisms, predators, right? Like mice, squirrels, insects, even fungus, right? In us, because we're so much more robust, actually offers a strengthening effect. And also the bacteria consume those products as well and end up releasing metabolites that we see are very beneficial for human health. So there are those two factors. And then also there are different compounds that aren't necessarily, um, you know, plant toxins, but are like pigments, for example, that we see benefit human health, whether we're talking about anthocyanins that are found in um, blackberries and blueberries or carotenoids, which I'm a huge fan of for their um, benefit that they play to brain health and, and, and eye tissue. Um, like lutein and zeaxanthin that, that we see in vegetables like kale um, and uh, and avocados and things like that. So, yeah, I would say that that veg veggies are really great for you. Um, it's just again, it's about finding which ones you tolerate best, and then and then sticking with those. Also, there's a difference between in terms of vegetable tolerance between uh, raw and cooked veggies. Some people do really well with cooked veggies, and yet raw vegetables pose a, a digestive challenge. So. Um, you know, we speak in terms of generalities, um, but but yeah, again, ultimately veggies are, are are great. It's funny to imagine like some poor field mouse chowing down on some kale that a farmer's planted and just being really farty that night and being like, <laughs> "I've got to stop doing this." Yeah, it's um, but that's actually, but that's that's how it happens. That's why these many of these compounds get developed. For example, when you chew cruciferous vegetables, a compound is created in your mouth called sulforaphane which we know is a potent cancer fighter. It increases levels of glutathione in the body. It's been shown to reduce inflammation. But if you actually look at uh, the, like if you, if you were to put um, a slice, a cross section of a cruciferous vegetable like broccoli under a microscope, you wouldn't actually find sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is created, um, it's, it's created by the enzymatic reaction of two different, of two chemicals that are held in separate cellular compartments. That's only created when the when those cellular compartments are broken open, are are, are ultimately damaged. So it literally is like an uh, an insect or a mouse antifeedant that's that's created when these two separate chemicals are united to create this this toxin, right? That would sicken perhaps or at least ward off a predator because of its bitter taste. But in us, you know, we're much we're much less sensitive, and so it has that that sort of hormetic effect. It's really cool. Yeah. I've started eating um, broccoli sprouts um, because I heard they were high in sulforaphane. And then I have been, I've been to the farmer's market. And there seems to be these, uh, this, uh, maybe there are two at the Beverly Hills farmer's market that have uh, sprouts that are, they're, they're selling by the bag full. And sulforaphane is something that I hadn't heard of until recently. And you're saying that it's anti, it, it fights cancer, fights cancer cells? Yeah, there's a lot of research um, on sulforaphane. Uh, most of it is, is in vitro. So we see like in Petri dishes, but it is hailed, um, in the medical literature as being a putative cancer fighter. So it, it can help fight, you know, via a number of different mechanisms, cancer. That doesn't mean that it's a, I'm saying that it's a cure for cancer. That's not what I'm saying, but right. that, but that it can, um, for example, have, it has some, you know, immunologic function that is, that is sort of counter to, um, you know, how cancer develops. It's also and then supposed how, to be good. How for do the, you, sorry, mate, go on, please. Yeah, it's supposed to be, it's, I mean, they've, they've done studies, clinical trials showing that it can improve um, brain function, that it can reduce symptoms in autism spectrum disorder. These are early studies. You know, it's not like there's big broccoli, uh, you know, throwing money at the, at the clinical trials utilizing mm -hmm. sulforaphane, but there is a, there is a sort of converging body of evidence showing us that this is a, a very beneficial compound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked about, so we've talked about, you know, you've cleared that up beautifully, cleared up, are vegetables good for you? Are they bad for you? They're good for you. We know that we've heard it. We hear a lot of bull crap out there about meat. Um, I really want to 
clear that up with you too. Can you help clear that up for me? Is meat bad for you? Uh, meat is definitely not bad for you. I mean, there are different kinds of meat, right? Like meat isn't meat, isn't meat. But ultimately I think that it's, uh, when looking at red meat, um, which I'm assuming you're talking about, it's a very nutrient dense food. Um, it's a food that provides highly bioavailable micronutrients like zinc, like creatine, like vitamin B12. These are nutrients, um, zinc and vitamin B12 in particular that tend to be under consumed today. Um, and they're in their most bioavailable form. So nutri a nutrient isn't a nutrient, right? Like there are different forms of vitamin B12. There are different um, forms of zinc. There are also compounds in plants, for example, um, that act as anti-nutrients that inhibit the absorption of minerals like zinc. That's not the case with um, the minerals found in, in animal products. You, it's plug and play for human biology. You also get um, a small but significant amount of omega-3 fats, uh, and of course you get a pristine source of protein, the, the highest biological value source of protein found in nature. Now, some people will do better, um, with leaner meats. Um, I think that, you know, now that, that we're sort of out of the era that has, um, really demonized fat for so many years, I think we're now the pendulum has swung in the other direction where you see a lot of people eating excessively fatty meat and putting butter in their coffee and things like that. Some people, for some people, that'll be fine. Everybody's different. But for some, eating lots of animal fat is going to drive up LDL. It's going to increase levels of ApoB, which um, is still a, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Does that mean that meat is unhealthy? Absolutely not. I think that the benefits outweigh the risks, um, especially when looking at something like, like lean meat, which exists. And so, uh, and that's not to say that all the meat that I eat is lean. Like I enjoy ribeyes and, and, and the fat in meat is very chemically stable. It's um, it's primarily monounsaturated fat, actually, if you're looking at the fat from a grass fed, grass finished cow. And so, uh, yeah, so for me, I think that it's, a it's, it is actually a health food. There's been, when looking at the population level, it's really hard to tease out the benefits or the, um, adverse effects of any singular food item because people don't eat single foods in isolation, right? They're not, um, animals in a, in a controlled lab setting, right? We eat we consume dietary patterns and we eat meals and at the population level, you see that people who consume meat, more meat tend to uh, be more sedentary. They tend to smoke more. They tend to be at higher risk of obesity. Right. And people that eat more vegetables, more fresh fruits, right. They tend to exercise more. They tend to, because that's so not the norm in the standard, in the context of the, of the standard American diet, right? The standard American diet, just to paint a picture for your audience, 60% of the calories that your average person consumes today comes from ultra processed foods. So these are like Franken foods essentially made in the lab. And so if you isolate individuals in this country today in the year 2022 that are eating primarily fruits and vegetables, whole grains and things like that, you'll see probably really good health in that population, but it's correlation doesn't equal causation. So it's impossible to say with that kind of research that, oh, it's the fruits and vegetables that are beneficial. Oh, it's the grains that are beneficial. Same thing with meat. Um, but, you know, when you actually look at what meat is, it's a very uh, nutrient dense. It's one of the most nutrient dense foods um, available to a modern, a modern human. So, uh, so for that reason, I think it's definitely worth incorporating. It's also a great source of choline, which we know is really important for brain health. Um, am, am I saying that you should be eating all meat all the time or excessively fatty meat? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I think that meat definitely can play a role in, a, in an optimal diet for humans. Yeah, I, I've always thought about the, the the studies that they do on people who eat meat. Uh, well, they like you said, you can't just find you know uh, people who eat just meat, or you can't kind of test one type of food and see. Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense to me that vegans and vegetarians who are very conscious about what they're eating really like looking at what they're eating and making sure that there's no meat in it. That that creates a consciousness around food that perhaps cr like helps you be healthy. Whereas if you're just like laissez-faire, you just eat everything, that can cause poor health. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, what you just described is called the healthy user bias. So it's like somebody who's on a vegan or vegetarian diet is probably n very neurotic about their food, right? I mean, for one, a vegan diet is a very restrictive fringe diet. So you take somebody who's on that diet and they're, pay they're paying, they're hypervigilant, right, to the foods that they're eating, that person, especially in the context of the modern food environment, which we know is, is primarily, uh, an omnivorous diet. Right. Um, but with meat, I mean, 
you know, especially with lean meat. Now with, with fatty meat, you'll, you can feed it to somebody and you'll see probably levels of, of ApoB, which is a, a, you know, a risk marker for, for heart disease increase. There's debate as to, you know, how much it needs to increase for one to be worried, especially if it's a single number that's elevated in, in isolation. But at the end of the day, red meat can be a, a powerful tool to actually shift your body composition to a healthier state, right? Because it's a great source of protein. It's also very satiating. Protein is a very satiating macronutrient. And there have been no long-term randomized control trials to show us that red meat is unhealthy. We, there, are, there are actually studies that show us the inverse, in fact. Um, so, you know, I think when, especially we see this advice online to, to just like X out an incredibly broad category of foods like animal products is, I think we, we need to be very skeptical of that advice, especially knowing that meat played such a pivotal role in our evolution, right? The evolution of, of the human form of the human brain in particular, meat played a, a pivotal role this, the cooking of meat in particular. So also every food has benefits and risks this is true for plants certainly you know plants have compounds we talked about them S certain plants have have toxic compounds that you individually might um not react well to also plants in general tend to absorb uh heavy metals depending on where they're grown um the dose makes the poison with these sorts of things but um there are risks to consuming like any food especially if it's a food that you're consuming a lot of on a regular basis, right? The same thing is true for, for animal products, right? If all you're doing is consuming fatty meat um, with every meal and you're, for example, genetically prone to hypercholesterolemia or, or high cholesterol, then that might be a problem for you. But that doesn't mean that it's unhealthy for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I also hear a lot of people talking about how you can get plenty of protein from plants. Is animal protein superior to plant protein? Animal protein is superior to plant protein. Yeah, I would say that, you know, there is, um, so you can look at uh, different um, indicators of protein quality, um, digestibility, and in in, in, to be specific, um, the latest one, or the one that's, that's currently in, in use by the FAO is the digestible indispensable amino acid score. And we see that animal protein trumps plant, plant protein across the board with the exception of maybe soy. Soy is highly digestible um, and a good option for people who are on plant uh, exclusive diets. Um, but animal protein is, is vastly more digestible than the protein in legumes. Um, and it also has a higher concentration of essential amino acids and in particular branch chain amino acids like leucine, which we know are critically important for stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So animal protein, um, yeah, it is, it is higher quality. Also, you have to consume a lot more plant protein to get the same amount of leucine and, and essential amino acids, but also in, in so doing, you're consuming a lot of extra calories from carbohydrates generally. Right. So if you are, for example, on a weight loss journey, which not everybody is, that's fine. But if you're on a weight loss journey, it is important to know that you're going to get that, that the protein is going to be most concentrated in animal, in, in animal products. Yeah, that's super interesting. I want to talk a bit about choline. You mentioned it before. What, I don't think there are vegan sources of choline, are there? It's all animal no, there, animals. There, no, no, no. There are. You can get you can get choline in plants, but it's just it's in a in a much lower concentration. It's not as abundant. Like an egg yolk is like the primary the the top source of choline that I'm that I'm familiar with. You get about 125 milligrams of choline in just like a single egg yolk. Yeah. Wow. And so, what role does choline play for our mental capacity for our brain health? Choline's it used to be actually considered a, a B vitamin. Um, now we consider it conditionally essential. And I believe you need about four to 500 milligrams of it every day. I think 90% of people don't meet that adequate intake for choline. Um, again, it's, it's most abundantly found in animal products. So egg yolks, red meat, great sources of, of choline. Um, studies show that people, uh, older adults who consume more choline have a 30% risk reduction for developing cognitive decline, which is noteworthy because you hear in some circles that meat is bad for the brain, right? But choline is primarily found in animal products. So, mm. I mean, right there, that dispels that myth, right? That, that animal products are, are somehow bad for the brain, but choline yeah, is the name. Yeah. Go on, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a good sort of proxy indicator for 
for meat consumption, right? Because that's where it's primarily found. You get it in, you can find it in small amounts in like Brussels sprouts and, and different plants, but um, it's just not as abundant. And uh, it primarily is used in the body as a, um, it's the backbone for acetylcholine, which is a, a neurotransmitter that's important for learning and memory. And it also helps to form what's called the phospholipid bilayer, which is important for neuronal health. So your brain cell membranes, right? Your me the membranes are the sort of barrier that protects your brain cells and also provide the ears so that your brain cells can hear what neighboring brain cells, right? Because they communicate through receptors that bob up to the surface of these of these membranes, right? So they, they need to stay nice and supple and fluid. And so um, we need choline to basically form the, the, the backbone of those um, of the molecules that form the phospholipid bilayer, which forms the, the neuronal membrane. I remember the first time I listened to a podcast with you, you were talking to Ben Greenfield and about halfway through, I just, I, I was too dumb for it. <laughs> I had to turn it off. I was like, this is, they're, they're too, too smart for me. Um, <laughs> I don't know about so, that. Uh, I'm just, a, I'm, <laughs> I'm just a big, I'm a nerd for this stuff. Like I love, I can count on one hand the things that I love in life. It's movies, it's music, and it's health science. And that's it. I just go deep on those topics. And I don't know anything about anything else. Well, that's good because that's what I want to – I want to have people like you on who are passionate about health and wellness because I am can't listen. I I'm, I just want you to make it nice and simple <laughs> so that I, if I can get it, I know everyone will get it. You know what I mean? Um, but I just remember listening to that conversation going, I, I, I want to have – I want to hear him talk one day and get him to explain the things that I don't understand. Love it. Well, we're doing it. Dream come, dream come true. You've dream come true. It. Bucket list shit right here. <laughs> I want to talk about um, sourcing meat. I want to talk about like um, you go into in the book, you know, it's ideal to have pasture raised grass fed meats um, for a lot of people. Well, tell us firstly why that is. Why is it ideal to have pasture raised grass fed meat? So what a cow, what a cow eats primarily dictates the healthiness of its fat content. And so we mm. talked a little bit about how, you know, fatty meat in some can drive up levels of, of LDL, which is a sort of biomarker long associated with risk for cardiovascular disease, but fat isn't fat, right? Like even within the fat of a ribeye, you have different fatty acids and the ratios of those different fatty acids and their ultimate biologic impact on, on, on your body differs by the, by the fatty acid con constituency of the, of the fat in a, in a ribeye and what a cow eats dictates what's in that fat. Um, the bio, we know that the biologically appropriate diet for, for a cow is grass. Gra ca cows when left to their own devices, love to graze pasture all day. That's what they, that's what they do. But the modern industrial food complex has, um, basically forced cows into these concentrated feeding operations where they're fed, um, particularly at the end of their life, grain and other, other byproducts of the food industry. Uh, sometimes they're even given candy. So it's like, it's actually quite, uh, an, an abomination how cows are treated. But when you feed a cow grain, what happens is there ends up being more saturated fatty acids in the fat. So even though the fat might, might look the same, right? Um, you're seeing more saturated fat in the, uh, in the, uh, fat of a cow that's been grain finished and the saturated fatty acids are different. So you actually see higher levels or you see rather lower levels of stearic acid in the, uh, fat of a cow that's been grain finished and stearic acid actually has a neutral effect on, um, on blood lipids and actually has been shown to, um, be, beneficial from the standpoint of our mitochondria. It's been shown that stearic acid can actually boost mitochondrial function. So mitochondria are the organelles in our cells that um, create energy, right? The, the ener energetic currency of life is ATP. Mitochondria create ATP. And this fatty acid found in the fat of, gr of grass finished cows actually has like this, this really beneficial impact on our mitochondria. But when you feed a cow grain like corn, you're getting less of that. You're getting more saturated fat overall. You're getting, um, I believe, higher levels of omega-6 fatty acids, lower levels of omega-3 fatty acids. You're get, getting fewer, um, you're getting less uh, carotenoids, which are these plant compounds. So when cows eat grass, they eat more carotenoids, which are these plant pigments 
that then get embedded into the fat tissue that we then ingest and help support brain health, eye health. So there's, there's all these like differences, right? Um, in, in fat and also a, a grass finished cow is leaner overall. So you're getting higher protein, um, concentration, less fat calories overall. Um, which I think is, is important because like fat is not bad, but fat carbohydrates, they're both forms of energy. And we live in a time of energy toxicity essentially, because we're just, we, we, we live in, uh, a world where for the first time in human history, there are more overweight people walking the earth than underweight. It's because we're eating too much, right? We're eating too much energy. Um, we're in a hyper energetic state, most of us. And so, um, and so, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a problem. And that's, that's why I think it's, if you can, if you can afford it, if you can access it, it's better to reach for, you know, for grass finished, um, meat. That being said, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm adamant that even grain finished beef is still very nutrient dense and a great source of protein. And that if that's all you can access and afford, then you should still be buying that. I mean, you can buy leaner meat. If you compare a filet mignon, for example, or tenderloin, let's just say from a grass finished cow and a grain finished cow, because that's a, a lean, a relatively lean cut of meat, there's very little functional difference between the two. It's only when you get to the fattier cuts of meat, like ribeyes, for example, where what, a, what the cow has eaten really um, comes into play and matters. Yeah, that's super interesting. I want to talk about that because people who are, you know, are on a budget can't afford a lot of beautiful cuts of grass fed meat. What do you recommend for people like them? It, is it going for, you know, a leaner cut of grain fed meat or what I usually say to my friends who um, can't afford beautiful grass fed meat is just buy grass fed ground meat. Yeah. That's a great, that's great advice. Yeah. I, I, I usually say that too. It's a gr ground meat is a wonderfully economical way to get the benefits of grass finished meat. It's just cheaper. You can usually find a pound. I mean, I know that Trader Joe's carries it. You can now find it in the freezer section at Costco. Um, but yeah, if you, if you can't find, if you don't have access to that, um, yeah, go for, go for grain finished. I mean, go for, I don't like, you know, it's like, it's difficult to endorse because I, I know that in saying this, I'm, I'm, I'm indirectly advocating for the factory farm system, which is not my goal. Like, uh, you know, right. the way they treat animals, what it does to the environment, it's all bad really. But from the standpoint of human health, individual human health, even grain finished meat is still, um, a health food when compared to what, what Americans are typically eating for dinner. Right. So if you can get a lean piece of like tenderloin, it's a great option. And also you don't have to eat beef. You can eat poultry. You can eat, I think pork is a great option. It's just, you know, for me, it's important to drive home the fact that animal products are very nutrient dense and they tend to get, uh, you know, they've, they've over the, especially over the past couple of years with this push towards, you know, these plant-based fake meat products, meat has been canceled. And I think it's time to come back to our senses and realize that um, for many people, it's going to be a much better option for dinner than what they're currently consuming. Yeah. My roommate used to work for Beyond Meat and um, I, we, we made it for a very interesting dinner time because she'd always, you know, wander down to eat a dinner and I'd cooked up some steaks or, uh, a, 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 you know, a steaky stew from, from a chuck roast and she would plant herself down and I go, Oh, staying for dinner then, are you? And she'd chow down, mate. I tell you what, and she had all this Beyond Meat in the freezer. Not once did I see her eat it. Not once. Wow. Wow. It's it's because I mean, I, and I was I'd always we'd 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 argue all the time, but I'm like, this is trash. Look at it. The second ingredient in it is is, can, is canola oil. I really want to talk about oils and stuff like that with you. But before we go there, you did mention other food sources. Let's talk about um fish and omega threes. Um, why is fish great for you? And particularly, I want to talk about omega threes. Yeah. So fish is medicine when it comes to the brain. And, um, and, you know, fish has a lot in common with, with animal products like beef, like fish, you'll still find saturated fat in fish. You'll still find dietary cholesterol in fish and fish is consistently fish consumption is consistently associated with better cardiovascular health, better neurologic health, better cognitive, uh, health for our, our offspring. Um, and I think it comes down, well, I think it comes down to many things, but, um, fish is, uh, uh, major source of omega-3 fatty acids. So when it comes to omega-3 fats, 
you're not going to find a more concentrated source than fish. It's just because fish, you know, fisher, they fish have to navigate uh, the obviously undersea um, environment. And so the temperatures down there are a lot cooler. And so their cell membranes are constituted of fats that have to stay fluid at colder temperatures, right? At cold temperature, saturated fat becomes hard, right? Like if you take a piece of red meat and you put it in the fridge, the, the fat gets hard, right? When it's cold and then you leave it out at room temperature, it softens up, right? Um, fish are in refrigerator temperature environments. That's their world, right? So their fats are much different. They're primarily polyunsaturated. So they have less saturated fat. They have a higher um, proportion of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. And primarily the polyunsaturated fatty acids that we want from fish are the omega-3 fats, which are essential fatty acids. We need to consume them um, to live for, for, for good health. And so the two in particular that um, are of note are eicosapentaenoic acid, which is EPA, fat, EPA, EPA fatty acid, and docosahexaenoic fatty acid or DHA fat. And DHA is one of the most important structural building blocks of the brain. Um, and EPA is primarily thought of as an anti-inflammatory fat, uh, but we need both. We need to get both. And the beautiful thing about eating fish is that when we ingest these fats, they're in their preformed plug and play state, much like I was, how I was describing minerals like zinc and vitamin B12 in animal products. Like mm -hmm. when we eat fish, it's like our bodies know what to do with, with those nutrients, right? That's not the case for plant-based forms of omega-3s, right? If you were to eat a handful of walnuts or chia seeds or flax seeds, you're getting a plant-based form of omega-3s called alpha linolenic acid, but people vary widely in their ability to convert that, the plant-based omega-3 to its usable form in the body. It depends on genes, uh, gender, ancestry, et cetera. Um, but when you eat fish, you are directly um, enriching your brain with the DHA fat that it contains. And the, 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 the primary, um, the, the, the most valuable fish from that standpoint are the wild fatty cold water fish like salmon, sardines, herring, and things like that. Yeah, I love it. Um, how often do you think a week a person should be eating, you know, salmon, or these cold water fish, or should they be supplementing with it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's what the research says is if you consume fish one to two to three times a week, um, that's you're, you're getting a pretty strong risk reduction for developing Alzheimer's disease, even if you're genetically at risk. But for me, mm -hmm. I eat fatty fish, you know, maybe three, four times a week. Cause every meal I'm primarily focusing on, on protein with every meal. And I eat two, maybe three meals a day. Um, and I think it's important to cycle your protein. So I'm not eating beef at every meal. I'm, I'm, you know, one meal and I, I go, you know, more based on intuition. Um, you know, one meal I'll have grass fed beef. The next meal I'll have a piece of salmon, you know, the next day I'll have, I'll have a piece of poultry. Maybe I'll have beef for dinner that night, you know? Mm. And why is it important to cycle like that? Well, I think it's just that you get, you get a different array of micronutrients in different proteins. Mm. You know, I think it's like when you have a stock portfolio, right? Like diversity is key. You want to have diversity so that you're future, future proofing your, your, your financial, um, nest egg, right? Well, I think this. I think that we can borrow some of that wisdom and apply it to our own biology when it comes to the foods that we're choosing to ingest, right? Like each food is different and we don't want to eat any singular food too much just because it's like, that's probably not like how our ancestors um, ate these foods. There was seasonal variability in terms of food access, um, depending on where in the world our ancestors evolved. There was, there was a difference with regard to what animals were there, the fauna, local fauna. So, um, so I think it, I think there's probably some wisdom, uh, in that, in, 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 you know, varying it up meal to meal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, now that we're talking about supplements, um, do you supplement with fish oil? And I really want to know what else you supplement with. Yeah, I do. I supplement with fish oil. I take, uh, between two and four grams of combined EPA and DHA every day. Um, I do this for the omega-3 fatty acids. I do it because there's some evidence that fish oil can help with like body composition. I forget the exact, you know, I don't want to make any 
any crazy claims, but it's either like muscle growth or, or fat loss or something like that. There's, you know, there's interesting research on that. Um, there's a, an FDA approved drug that's uh, primarily composed of EPA fat, which is in fish oil that um, uh, lowers uh, triglycerides, which is, um, you know, like a cool, a cool thing. So yeah, I take yep. between two and four grams of, of fish oil every day. And I think when it comes to like buying a fish oil supplement, you really want to like buy the best that you can afford, you know, like mm -hmm. buying like a vitamin or a, or a mineral, the form matters, but the, like the brand doesn't so much matter, but fish oil is a little bit different because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acid, which is a type of fat that's very prone to oxidation. You want to make sure that it's from a brand that you trust. You know? Yeah. So what are, what are things that we can look out for on a fish oil supplement that will tell us, like if it's, if it's caught cold water, if it's kept in a dark jar, for instance, that can have a difference. Yeah. You, you would not want to consume fish oil that's been, that's kept in a, in a like perfectly see-through jar because oxidation is driven by exposure to oxygen, to light, to heat. You want to make sure that it's kept in a plastic bottle, you know, or a glass bottle, but that's, that's darkly colored, that's been stored. It doesn't have to be refrigerated, but that's stored in a cool environment. Um, generally, I mean, so, you know, one thing that you could look out for is IFO certification on the fish oil bottle, which is, uh, I believe it stands for the International Fish Oil Standards. Um, they test and they look for oxidation um, in random batches. And so if a brand is IFO certified, generally that's going to be a high quality, high quality fish oil. Got it. Now hit me with what else you're supplementing with. Cause I know you're a supplement King. Yeah. I mean, I take magnesium regularly. I take about 400 milligrams of magnesium glycinate every day. That's nice. great for brain health. Magnesium is one of these minerals that, um, most people under consume and it doesn't have just one benefit. It has dozens of benefits from brain health to preventing migraines to helping, you know, activate DNA repair enzymes, which is important for anti-aging purposes to creating energy. I mean, it's a, it's literally like one of these, like it's got so many side hustles in the body. It's just, it's so crucially important. Something like three to 400, um, reactions in the body are, are limited by magnesium availability. And if 60% of us under consume magnesium, then we're handicapping our bodies in profound ways. Most of which being on being invisible, there's actually this concept of the Bruce aimed coined it. It's called the, the triage theory of aging. And it basically posits that when a micronutrient, um, becomes scarcely available in the body, the, it gets sort of funneled into the, what, what little is there gets funneled to support the processes that support, um, immediate survival and the processes that, that encourage our long-term health, right. Actually take the back seat and become handicapped. So, you know, magnesium is one of these, the, the, it's like the perfect example of a, of a mineral that has all these different, it plays all these different roles in the body that range from immediate survival, right? Like creating energy, ATP, but all the way up to like DNA repair, which is going to be important for helping us age well and prevent age related diseases, right? Like cancer, like cardiovascular disease. So for me, getting, getting adequate magnesium on a daily basis is, is uh, mission critical, I think, to aging well. I also supplement with another compound called astaxanthin, which is a, a carotenoid that's important for eye health, brain health, skin health. Um, and uh, that's it. I'm not like a big supplementer. I, I take, I don't know if you would count like a protein powder as a supplement, but I take protein powder pretty regularly. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't count that to be, I, I mean, I've, I've been a supplement like madman before, like buying everything that I heard Ben Greenfield or Dave Asprey talk about. And recently I've just got, cut it down to vi vitamin C, uh, cod liver oil, fish oil, and magnesium. And that, and I'm just like, I think that's enough, you know, and get out in the sun every day. And, yeah. um, and I'm like, yeah, cause I, I, I could drive myself nuts. Like all the, like, I, I remember like traveling for work and taking about like, 20 bottles of different things that if I forgot to take it on a certain day, it's like, Oh, well, what's going to happen now? God yeah. knows. No. Yeah. You, I think like people go overboard with supplementation and, um, taking, taking any supplement for a few weeks at a time, it's not going to do much for you. You know, it's like about 
taking it over the long term. And so you want to pick a supplement regimen that's going to be sustainable for you. And I just don't think that for most people, a handful of supplements is really all that sustainable. Um, yeah. And also like you can get a lot from food, especially if you're not on, if you're not restricting yourself for some ideological reason, you know, like people that, um, you know, I mean, there's the, I like all foods pretty much. Like, I mean, I, I say, I try to stay, uh, away from junk food and I, I'm not a big grain consumer. Um, but generally I eat fish, I eat beef, I eat eggs, I eat all those things. And then I eat fruit and, and vegetables, um, when I want. So if you're eating a, 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 a diet that's like diverse, um, I think you're going to have less need for supplementation ultimately. Yeah. Are you on board with the adaptogen lion's mane, reishi fungal thing? I think they're cool. I mean, they're, they're, it's not like there's no research on them. There's, uh, there is, there is some research on them compounds like ashwagandha and reishi. Mm. Um, and also I, you know, I'm a big believer that absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence, meaning that just because we don't have any like Western rigorous scientific randomized controlled studies to pr show the efficacy of a compound doesn't mean that it's not worth trying. Um, you know, because there is like wisdom to be gleaned from the ages from Western or from rather Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, for example, who have used some of these compounds for, for millennia. So, um, I'm not, uh, you know, I'll, I'll sort of bring, I'll cycle like some of these compounds in and out and, and see how they make me feel lately. I've been, I've been messing with ashwagandha as like a stress relieving adaptogen. Um, you've released and, a book, uh, mate. It can be stressful. It is. Ironically, you're on some release talk show this morning and now you're here and it's a lot, your brain's going through a lot. Like it makes sense that you would be taking ashwagandha now. Yeah. I mean, you must f experience that when you're like promoting a new like movie or show, right? Like it's well, it's, when you're on, when you're on a show and you're learning a bunch of lines day in, day out, then ashwagandha is necessary. I was loving ashwagandha and then, you know, was like, it's probably best to allow my adrenals to handle just nominal, you know, average stress without it. Yeah. So I got off it, but when I do, when I do feel like I'm, I've got a big day and I'm stressed about it, I take ashwagandha. I don't know if you can hear my son, but he's screaming in the background. <laughs> he needs some ashwagandha. Uh, he needs a little bit. <laughs> yeah, just throw it at him. <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I can relate. Like writing a book, releasing a book, it's not healthy, ironically. And I write health books, but um, so yeah, all the help you can get is is probably uh, wise, but. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm generally like in favor of those compounds. I have nothing, nothing against them. Yeah. Um, I do. Oh my gosh. She's really screaming down there. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, oh, there's a chemistry lesson in your cookbook about, uh, fatty acids and about the, those compounds, about how they work. I really want you to qu try and give me a rundown of that chemistry lesson of saturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats, those bonds that they create and kind of like give me a run on it so I can understand it. And then, you know, that can affect our health, choosing which fats to use, which fats to eat, which fats to cook with. Yeah, absolutely. So you have, um, there's a, there's a spectrum and you have fats that are more saturated and less saturated. And the more saturated a fat is, the more chemically stable it's going to be, the less prone to oxidation it's going to be. Oxidation is a fancy way of saying aging and decay, right? Like when you slice an apple, when you leave it on, on the counter and it, and it goes brown, it's, it's oxidizing. Um, when rust, when iron oxidizes, it rusts, right? Like an avocado that's been sliced open and exposed to oxygen, it's oxidizing. So that, that's ultimately what oxidation is. Um, and so this can occur to fats, right? Saturated fat is very uh, resistant to oxidation. And then you have the two um, unsaturated fatty acids, polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats, and they are um, more prone to oxidation. Un uh, monounsaturated fat is somewhat more resistant um, and is is pretty uh, safe to consume um, under under everyday circumstances. And then we have polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are the most prone to oxidation. Now, all of these fats when found in whole foods um, are beneficial, right? They're all great. F nature has um, packaged these fats with the appropriate amount of antioxidants, 
required to protect them, right? So in saturated, in, in, animal, in, in uh, foods that have primarily saturated fat, you don't really see a ton of antioxidants because saturated fat is so resistant to oxidation, right? But at the other end of the spectrum, you have polyunsaturated fats, which are very prone to oxidation. And so nature has packaged them usually with vitamin E, which is um, one of its primary roles is to prevent the oxidation of polyunsaturated fats. So anywhere you see lots of polyunsaturated fatty acids, for example, walnuts, you'll see lots of vitamin E. The issue is when we extract these oils and we process them to create cooking oils, um, we're basically stripping them of their of those antioxidants that nature has packaged them with, and we're leaving them vulnerable to this to this decay process, right? Yep. And that accelerates when we cook with them, when they're used to create um, ultra processed food products. And oxidized fats are not safe to consume. They're, I mean, you know, there's debate, I think, in the, in the, in the wellness community these days as to what the ultimate harm is from consuming them. But generally, like, why, I don't under, you wouldn't advocate that somebody consume rotten fruit. So why anybody would choose to consume rancid polyunsaturated fats when there are better options out there generally available to most of us, like extra virgin olive oil, which is chemically very stable. It's primarily monounsaturated fat. It has uh, an abundance of plant antioxidants in it. Um, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so, yeah, so the problem with polyunsaturated dominant oils like corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil, is that there is a significant degree of oxidation that those fats have already um, undergone by the time we purchase them. And then we heat them. Sometimes we re reheat them. We ingest them in restaurants in the form of fried foods, sauteed foods. And so, so we're consuming these oxidized fats, which um, embed themselves in our tissue, right? Our fat tissue, the lipoproteins that circulate throughout our body. We don't really know what the, the chronic consumption of these fats does over the long term to our brains also which is something that I think we need to be really um, cautious of because our brains are made primarily of polyunsaturated fats. So we want to consume the, we want to consume polyunsaturated fats, but we want to consume them when they're in their pristine form bound with these antioxidants that protect them. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about um, opting for extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, which are primarily monounsaturated. They're very chemically stable. Um, and then consuming saturated fat, fats that are more saturated in, um, whole foods, right? And not overdoing it, especially if we're prone to uh, hypercholesterolemia or high cholesterol levels. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really about minimizing our, our exposure to the grain and seed oils, uh, canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, grapeseed oil. Max, I want to congratulate you because I finally understand that. And I didn't before. Oh, man. It's... Uh, I, well, I, yeah. I, when I picked up your book, Genius Kitchen, I was like, well, this isn't for me. <laughs> Not a genius. And then I read the, that part and I was like, you know what? I was reading it. I was like, I don't get what he's talking about. I'm going to just ask him about it today. And here you are explaining it and I fully understood it. So I'm very thankful. Yeah. It's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's debate, right? Like people, people, right. they'll, they'll be these short term studies. Like they'll do four week studies in humans and they'll feed, you know, let's just say fresh corn oil to subjects and they'll see that LDL levels come down, which is, that's not a debate. Polyunsaturated fats are going to lead to, uh, lower levels of LDL cholesterol. Um, and they won't necessarily see an increase in inflammatory markers. Right. But most people are consuming these fats like from, from fried foods, right? Like these fats have been sitting in the fryer for days. Sometimes, um, it's those kinds of fats that really, I think are the, are the most problematic. And, and also again, like we think as humans, like we have all the answers, but there's a tremendous amount of hubris that's involved in saying, we know that these oils, which have only been in the human food supply for the past hundred years, we know that they're safe, right? Based on, on the smattering of, of, of clinical trials that we have available to us, which many of which are funded by the, the, the cooking oil companies themselves, like the Mazolas of the world, right? Many of them, those, it's those companies that are funding these studies, which that doesn't invalidate them, but, um, but I think that we need to be incredibly uh, skeptical and cautious because, again, like our consumption of these oils has increased 
I mean, orders of magnitude um, over the past hundred years. They didn't exist in the in the human food supply pr prior to a hundred years ago. And over that time, we're we're seeing like insane rates of non-communicable chronic diseases, cancer, obesity, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease. Everything is increasing. Now, that's not to say that these oils are the smoking gun, right? I don't want to like pin all of society's health problems, modern health problems on these oils um, because correlation isn't necessarily causation. And we have to continue to do more research to tease out the role that they're playing. But um, but I think that's a, that's a non-trivial data point. And uh, and again, like I'm, my passion is brain health and, and like we, we don't know the long-term effects of, of basing our diets or, or, you know, over consuming these fats day in and day out in, uh, the context of the standard American diet, what the effect that these are having on our brains. Yeah. It seems to be fairly cut. And I mean, as far as somebody who's like not involved in the debate, it seems to be fairly cut and dry. It's like, you probably don't want to be going and eating fast food. You already knew that it's fried in these crappy oils, whatever don't eat that. You already knew that. And go and eat these good fats here with, which have like all these polyphenols in it and things that are good for you and also are a great source of energy for your brains and sex hormones, et cetera. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And also extra virgin olive oil, humans have been producing for thousands, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years, because to make extra virgin olive oil, all you do is you crush olives, right? It's this, it's the hallmark oil of the, there's like this irony in the, in the, in the Western medical literature. We, we, love to praise the uh, Mediterranean dietary pattern. And you go there, especially at the time in which the, this dietary pattern was sort of defined in the medical literature, it was all extra virgin olive oil, right? I mean, now they're using all these grain and seed oils because, you know, these global conglomerates are just like s literally saturating the world in them, right? But it, it was for many decades, primarily uh, extra virgin olive oil. And so we love to laud this dietary pattern for its cardioprotective, for its neuroprotective effects. But then the same people who will do that in the same breath, they'll say, yes, and, and consume more canola oil and grapeseed oil and, and soybean oil, right? It just doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense because you actually go to a kitchen in the Mediterranean, especially 50 years ago, and you wouldn't find any of these crap oils. Yeah, I mean, that's similar to um, a question we got a question that I got from a follower, which was talking about gluten um, and kind of what's happened to grain over the last hundred years. It's probably different. Like had I eaten a piece of the bread from a hundred years ago to what the bread I can buy in a store now. Talk to me about bread. Do you eat bread? And if you do, what type of bread do you eat? So I don't, I don't regularly eat bread. Um, I think that if you're going to eat bread, sourdough bread is a great option. Ezekiel bread, uh, another good option. I don't think that, I think that gluten is, we overconsume it. And I, it's not, it's a protein that no human can properly digest. Um, and that's not necessarily caused to eliminate it from your diet completely. But the problem I think today for many people is that we consume it, we're consuming it with every meal, right? Which is the dose of gluten that your average modern human is consuming is just unprecedented, right? Um, first of all, we, gluten was really only in the human food supply, uh, probably for just the past 100,000 years, um, you know, the advent of, of modern of, of agriculture and, and the point at which we went from being hunter gatherers to um, domesticated settlers, right? Um, but today in particular, our, our wheat is bred to contain more of it because it, it lends a mouthfeel that we really like. Uh, sometimes bread is, is enriched with even more gluten. Um, and we're consuming it in the context of widespread gut dysbiosis. So we talked a little bit about the microbiome in the gut, right? Which um, is really important. We've lost gut resilience, whether it's the overprescription of antibiotics or the fact that many of us are today born via C-section or, you know, the hygiene hypothesis where we're obsessed with sterility. So a lot of us have uh, issues with the gut microbiome. And I think that's one of the driving factors behind the um, increasing rates of, of autoimmunity that we see. Um, so in that context, I think the, just the overconsumption of gluten, I think is, is problematic. So for me, I'm not celiac, but I try to, uh, really closely sort of monitor my, my gluten consumption, or I guess monitor is the wrong word, but I try to like limit it, um, a lot. You know, I, I like most of the, the, the vast majority of foods that I enjoy don't contain gluten in it, um, naturally. And, uh, and if I, do have a craving for bread. Usually, I mean, there, there are really great, uh, like bread products now on the market that are more nutrient dense than your typical bread. 
typical bread is just, I mean, it's like refined flour. It's basically sugar with like, sometimes they'll add sugar. They'll put, they'll add oils to it. So it's, to me, it's not a health food, even though it's something that humans have been consuming for millennia. Uh, it's, it's just something that I, that I choose to avoid is gluten, the smoking gun in conditions like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease. I would not say that, but it's, it's just something that like, you know, again, no human can properly digest and yet we're consuming more of it than we ever have in human history. Yeah, mate, let's, um, let's take a few questions from my followers. Uh, how do you keep your brain healthy? I'm 36 and I forget everything. What foods increase concentration? I'm a desperate uni student. Any tips? Well, I would say, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I like to, uh, prioritize foods that have, that contain lutein and zeaxanthin, which are two carotenoids. Um, there was a University of Georgia study that found that among college students that were given supplemental lutein and zeaxanthin, those that, that supplemented, supplemented with these two compounds compared to the placebo group saw uh, about a 20% increase in their visual processing speed. So that's a, that's an aspect of our cognition that, you know, associated with like reaction time. Um, so prioritize foods like dark leafy greens, egg yolks, avocados, things like that, grass fed beef. Um, all great and highly bioavailable sources of, uh, of, of those two compounds. I think we talked a bit about this, but somebody asked what to eat to decrease LDL and increase HDL. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, to decrease LDL, I would say you ought to, and just to, you know, offer the disclaimer, I'm not a medical doctor, but, um, you know, it's, it's certain saturated fatty acids are going to be the primary drivers. It's, it's not for most people, the dietary cholesterol, um, dietary cholesterol has very little impact, uh, over the long term on our serum cholesterol, but saturated fats and primarily, you know, animal fats are going to be a, a, a driver. So, um, so that's one thing, but before, uh, tinkering with the, I mean, you could opt for leaner cuts of, of meat. If you're consuming a lot of red meat, for example, like go for, go for leaner cuts. But mm -hmm. also there are some things that, um, can also help like, uh, increasing fiber consumption. We know that when we consume, uh, dietary fiber, um, bile acids are comprised using cholesterol. And so when, um, when we consume dietary fiber and specifically psyllium husk, which is a great supplement that uh, is pretty widely available, it traps uh, cholesterol in the gut, preventing it from being reabsorbed. And so your liver then sucks out more cholesterol from circulation to create more bile acids. So increasing consumption of dietary fiber, um, reducing consumption of, of butter, which can drive up LDL. I'm a, I'm a fan of dairy. Um, and, and dairy fat, but butter in particular is, uh, and ghee can, can increase LDL mm. and, um, and, uh, and also get your thyroid checked out, like find a, a, a doctor, um, functional medicine doctor, maybe that can look at your thyroid function because even subclinical hypothyroidism can drive up levels of LDL. Uh, and also carbs. If you're on a very carb restricted diet, eating more carbs, like from tubers and stuff can help to bring LDL down. For, a, for HDL, I think you just have to make sure that you're not eating a no saturated fat diet because saturated fat still um, is, impor is, is important for, well, let me back up. HDL, I think is the, the latest understanding of, of the role that HDL plays in health. We used to think that driving HDL up was going to provide a cardioprotective effect because we see that higher levels of HDL is associated with better health and lower cardiovascular risk. But then they released a number of drugs or they, they, they ran an, a, a, bu a bunch of clinical tests on drugs that effectively drove up HDL and they provided no cardioprotective effect. So, um, so we shouldn't actually uh, be all that concerned with um, increasing our levels of HDL, but HDL should be viewed rather as an indicator of of overall health. So if you're exercising regularly, if you're sleeping well, if you're eating a nutrient dense diet, you're gonna, you'll, I think inevitably end up seeing your HDL, uh, come up. So I don't think that we should, we should try to move the dial on it through our diet. I think we'll end up seeing it come up when we're just in a, we, when we end up shifting ourselves to a healthier state. Um, got it. Yeah. 
Got it. Sweet. Um, I, somebody asked, this is kind of, um, oh, I'm going to say the C word post COVID brain fog. Have you got any tips for someone with post COVID brain fog? That's a good question. Um, nothing specific for post COVID brain fog. I was really lucky. I, I had COVID. I had the Delta variant a couple months ago. Um, not quite a year ago, but I, uh, I, yeah, I didn't have any, any long lasting, like cognitive COVID effects. And in fact, my, um, my COVID experience, I didn't lose my sense of smell or taste, which mm. uh, a neurologist friend of mine was saying is a pretty good indicator that you had like a, you had some kind of neuroprotect neuroprotection against that. Cause those are neurological symptoms after all. Right. Um, but I would say, yeah, just, I mean, check out, check out like my books and and whatever. And it's, it's that diet. It's not like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend a specific diet, but the, the diet choices that I generally recommend are, um, will inevitably be supportive of, of optimizing your brain health. Yeah. There was a very angry, um, woman who wrote a question about you recommending getting the vaccine, but I'm going to skip that question <laughs> because, uh, because shut up. Um, and then let's talk about, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about tips for those who are pregnant dealing with baby brain. Um, so I think, I think baby brain is when you are pregnant. Yeah. 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 So this woman's asking, she's pregnant. She's, she's got baby brain, which is like forgetfulness that happens. Um, any tips there? Yeah. So my understanding, um, is that the baby will, will suck the nutrients from the mother if the mother's not getting adequate nutrition from her diet. So, yeah. um, I would just dramatically f increase the consumption of DHA fat, of um so so fish oil and and wild fatty fish um choline crucially important eggs are eggs are a cognitive multivitamin so get the best eggs that you could afford pasteurized eggs or omega-3 enriched eggs and prioritize those in the in the diet i would eat three i mean if i were pregnant if i were a pregnant woman i would eat three you know four of those a day um and prioritizing the brain foods like the wild fatty fish red meat also i think very beneficial Yep. you're sharing a lot of nutrition with the with the fetus right so um yeah making sure that you're getting highly highly bioavailable micronutrients um and macronutrients like protein good stuff i have uh three different people who asked something like this is he single he's seriously cute <laughs> does he want to date me why are you such a snack so uh why are you such a snack oh my god can you answer that why am i such a snack I, uh, I don't, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. I mean, I'm, why you am I single? identify as a snack anyway? Cause you're not about snacking. You're about full meals. Right. I'm about full meals. Boom. Um, um I, are you single? I am single. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I am, I'm, I've been very work focused, but also, um, yeah, I don't know. I just like, first of all, I live in, I live in LA, which is like a difficult, you know, West Hollywood is not the, not the easiest place to date. And I don't, I don't really have the patience for like the, the games that, that people, uh, especially on the side of town tend to play. And it's also like girl, girls, women will slide into the DMS, but like a lot of the times their profiles are private. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. And then, you know, or it's like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I am like on the, on the pickier side too, but. Okay. Well, I mean, I you know, know what work, work focus, you talk a lot about balance in the diet. It's good to have a work life balance. It's appropriate. You've written this book. You, once you finish the publicity, how about we go out there and we get a, a lovely lady. Let's do it. Let's do it. You and me, Luke. Right. Well, not me. I'm just going to, I'll be on the side. Oh, I thought you, you were going to wing me. I'll wing you. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Okay. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Well, I've already got like three women right here asking. So. And, and, and a few of them were actually quite attractive, but we could talk about that off air. Um, nice. But let's, and on the subject of dating, would you date a vegan? Oh my God, putting me on the spot. I <laughs> probably would not date a vegan. I probably yeah. would not date a vegan. I'm not just saying that either. I, cause I value food. I love eating together and cooking and, you know, like, like group dinners to me, very important. And yeah. um, I just find it too, like, uh, to like, it's, it's just like an, uh, an important incompatibility. Um, I'm, I'm with you and I just want, so, so that you're not alone here. I agree. Um, and when I first met my wife, Cara, she was like vegetarian, vegetarian, flirting with vegan. 
and uh, she had leaky gut. She, uh, and, and it was like, yeah, I think you've got to start eating what I eat. <laughs> yeah. And so I was eating a lot of grass fed meat, a lot of wild fish. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, she, she really wouldn't mind me saying this, but she was, she had a leaky gut. She wasn't getting a regular period. And a year later we, she was pregnant and we had a baby. And wow. I think that that absolutely had something to do with it was the consumption 100%. Of, was, yeah, was a consumption of well-sourced animal product. A hundred percent. And also like food, isn't just food. It's how we express love. It's how we communicate. It's how we bond. If I'm not able to cook and share food with, with the person that I'm with, it's just, it's just not going to work. Right. You know, like it's going to add a layer of complexity and headache to meals that I, that I'm, that I'm cooking. I don't really want to bring tofu and that kind of stuff into my house, like fake meat products. So, yeah. Um, but furthermore, a, you know, when just... you, when you eventually, you know, if, if you were to want a family and, and want, you know, a, a healthy offspring feeding, you know, a mother who's eating a vegan diet, like while they're pregnant and then feeding their child a vegan product and not in any animal product seems, um, unethical at best. A thousand percent. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, I mean, I would, I would like go out with a, with a vegan, but, but ultimately I wouldn't, um, it's, it wouldn't be the right fit for long term. I love this little sugar sound bite. I'm so glad that we got to talk about this. Um, <laughs> tips, tips for kicking a sugar habit. Man. Um, well, I think, you know, using, uh, non nutritive sweeteners like stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, even artificial sweeteners, which I don't like to like endorse, but, um, but if, if you're, if that's what it takes to wean you off of the, the real stuff, then I think go for it. You know, um, I certainly will, you know, use plenty of stevia in my diet and, and monk fruit and the like. Um, and for people that might be hesitant, non-nutritive sweeteners today taste much better than they did 10, 20 years ago. So, um, so if you're hesitant, I mean, definitely like give it a shot. We know that sugar sweetened beverages are, one of the primary drivers of, of obesity in this country responsible for close to 185,000 deaths worldwide every year alone, sugar sweetened beverages. So wow. yeah, they're, they're a big problem. They're they, you know, empty calories. We have no satiety checkpoints for added sugar consumption. So yeah, again, one of the, one of the major problems with the modern, the modern food milieu. Um, but that being said, do you have to go cold turkey? No, I think you could just, you know, eat less and less and less, retrain your taste buds, um, you know, utilize some of these non-nutritive sweeteners. I think all super helpful. Love that, mate. Listen, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank you very much. You're a great resource. I can just tell I could ask you anything and I'd get a great answer. Um, but thanks so much for chatting with me today. Thank you, Luke. You're the man. It's been real fun. Appreciate it, Max. All right, great. Don't go anywhere, Max. You've got a, what? You want to give a rundown of like where to find him and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. We're going to edit this back on. We're not done. Yeah, yeah, great, sure great, great. On. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right. Well, um, I'm done talking with Max. Um, where can we find you, Max? And where can we buy your book, Genius Kitchen? Yeah, so I'm active on Instagram at Max Lugavere, M-A-X-L-U-G-A-V-E-R-E. I host a podcast of my own called The Genius Life. And uh, we'll have to get you on it, Luke. And, um, and my book genius kitchen is available wherever books are sold. You can go to geniuskitchenbook.com for all the links, but it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. We love when we support local bookstores. So you know, if you live by one you can look there, but yeah, thanks for any and all support. Uh, it, it's a pleasure. And, and just to clarify, it isn't just for geniuses. It's for anyone. And, and also Max don't have me on your podcast. Cause I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> dude i'm down i think we hey, have fun uh, yeah again such a pleasure and um yeah i'll talk to you soon